ministry and how they planted many churches against great opposition, great religious opposition, and they were all doing it to obey the Great Commission. Now, as we read through the life of Paul, we're going to see that over 13 years in his life, he was, went on three missionary journeys. He traveled 7,000 miles before planes, trains, and automobiles and planted at least 14 churches that we know of. And we see in the New Testament that they were about planting churches. Unfortunately, 85% of our Southern Baptist churches never multiply themselves in starting one new church. And you're going to see as you read through the New Testament, that's quite different. The New Testament was all about multiplying themselves. They were all about starting new churches. And so if you're guests with us, last week we started a series, I Love My Church. And it was I Love My Church Day. And, and we preached out of Acts 2, 37 through 47. And we looked at uh, in the macrocosm there, this healthy New Testament church that has just been birthed and is just growing in its early days. And showed you how that's where we get our best aid of pathway from. Of how you find out to love God and worship and find community in your life group. Saints go, how you make disciples and how you impact the world. And brought all that out of that passage there of how we're in there. But now we're up to Acts 13. And before we read this text, let me just give you uh, the, some information on this book. Acts 13 is a major dividing point in this book. And what happens before this in chapters 1 through 12, it's more of the Jewish church after Pentecost and Peter's the main leader because Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and they saw 3,000 saved. From the rest of the book on 13 through 28, it's more of the Gentile church. It's uh, talking about Paul as the main leader. Chapters 1 through 12, it's talking about how the church spreads from Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Chapters 13 through 28, it's talking about to the end of the earth and it's still not finished. Acts 2 through 12 took about 10 years to get the gospel to the Greeks and the Samaritans. Acts 13 through 28 is about taking the gospel to all the nations, and we still haven't finished that job. Uh, but the book of Acts is giving the history of the church. Now, the Greek word for church is ekklesia. It's not talking about a building with bricks. It's talking about the family of God. It's talking about the people of God. It's talking about... Uh, uh, how we're a family, the body of Christ. And so today we're going to be in Acts 13. We're going to be 1 through 12, major dividing point. We're going to look at the dividing point here in Acts and look at Acts 13, 1 through 12. So open up your Bible, turn on your Bible, and let's look at this text as we want to talk to you about today. I love the mission. Last week we talked about I love my church. Uh, and we had t-shirts. If you didn't get one, get with me. Call Kristen this week. We had some left over. If you did not get a t-shirt from last week, and it just basically has the name of our church and the logo, and I love my church. So if you'd like one of those and you would wear one of those out in the community, uh, just let us know and we'll get you one. So let's read this text, Acts 13, 1 through 12. It says, now in the church at Antioch, okay? Chapters 1 through 12. Main church was Jerusalem, okay? That's where Pentecost took place. Now we're in Antioch, okay? And, and the gospel has spread. It says there were prophets and teachers, okay? There's preachers and teachers here. Barnab Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And as they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work don't miss this phrase, to which I have called them. Okay? Then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Arriving in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. They also had John, that would be John Mark, as their assistant. And... When they had traveled the whole island as far as Paphos, they came across a sorcerer, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. And he was with the proconsul. Now, this would have been the governor, Sergius Paulus, okay? This is a politician. And it says he was an intelligent man. I didn't know we could have intelligent politicians after this week. But they had some back then. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the word of God. 
But Elimus, the sorcerer, that is the meaning of his name, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, also called Paul. Now, what's Saul? Saul was his Jewish name. Paul is his Roman name. Why is he going to be mentioned Paul from now on? Because he's going to be doing most of his ministry in the Roman Empire, okay? He's no longer, he will preach to Jews, but he's been called to take the gospel to the Gentiles, and so that's why he'll be referred to as Paul uh, for the most part in the rest of the New Testament. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit, stared straight at Elimus, and said, You are full of all kinds of deceits and trickery, you son of the devil, and enemy of all that is right. Won't you ever stop perverting the straight paths of the Lord? Look, the Lord's hand is against you. You are going to be blind and will not see the sun for a time. Immediately a mist and darkness fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Now verse 12. Then when he saw what happened, don't miss this, the proconsul believed because he was astonished. He was astonished at what? The teaching of the Lord. And so we want to look at I love the mission. And today, uh, the truth that I want to bring to you that I see in this text and I see in all the New Testament is this. The church is to be a sending church. The church is to be a sending church. Jerusalem church was. The Antioch church was a sending church. The New Testament was growing and multiplying, but they were sending out leaders to start other churches. You say, how? If you read chapter 3, they sent out Peter and John. Philip, Peter, and John were sent out in chapter 8. Peter and certain brethren were sent out in Acts 10. Men from Cyprus and Serene were sent out in chapter 11. Paul and Barnabas here were sent out in chapter 13. Judas, Silas, and Paul were sent out in 15. Barnabas and John Mark were sent out in chapter 15. Timothy, Paul, and Silas were sent out in chapter 16. Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla were sent out in 18. Timothy and Erastus were sent out in 19. You get the picture? <laughs> Everywhere you're turning, they're sending out leaders uh, to go out and do mission work and start other churches, but many of our churches are not sending churches. And I think we've forgotten what God has set the church up to be. So today I want to give you five reasons why that you and I should love the mission and be sent and be sending churches. Number one, the church with a heart for worship opens up opportunities for God to call people to missions. The church, don't miss this, with a heart for missions, opens up opportunities for God to call people to missions. Now, in verse 1, we see the church is a multicultural church. It's a multiracial church. It's a multigenerational church. And he mentions five people here. They're all, this is Luke. Luke wrote this. He's talking about preachers and teachers that are in a church. Now, we know Paul, uh, Barnabas, he mentions first, he was the son of encouragement. He, man, he had the gift of encouragement. Then he talks about Simeon there. Niger from North Africa, he's a black man, he's a Gentile. Lucius is a North African. He may have been a charter member of this Antioch church, we're not sure. But these two men had Latin names, which meant they were Roman, they were not Jews. Then you have Manian here. He was a close friend with Herod the Tetrarch. Now who is Herod the Tetrarch? He had John the Baptist beheaded and mocked Jesus. Now, before salvation, the last person mentioned here is Saul. Saul would have had nothing to do with anybody that gave worship to Rome. He would have had nothing to do with them. He would have had nothing to do with all these other people either. But he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and all of a sudden he started preaching Jesus as the Son of God, and now here he is a part of the church. See, see the church is all about people that are one in Christ. If you read Colossians 3.11, it says, Jew, Greek, circumcised, uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. What he's saying, we're all one in Jesus Christ no matter who we are. Praise the Lord, God can take lifelong enemies and reconcile them at the cross. He can take a Georgia Bulldog and a Florida Gator and reconcile them at the cross. Through the gospel. Amen? Amen? And that's what's going on here. And, and, and he says in verse 2, they're worshiping the Lord. They're ministering to the Lord. They're praying here. They're singing. They're serving. There's spiritual sacrifice and there's sacrificial service going on here. Hebrews 13, 15 talks about how our praise should, or, or we should continually offer the sacrifice of praise to our God. So they're giving their praise to God. They're worshiping God there, but they're...
God gets your attention. But, uh, man, they're worshiping. And when uh, people are worshiping, God shows up. <laughs> you never know, you know, when God is going to show up and do something, okay? And that's what's going on here. The Holy Spirit moved in the service. Now, these people weren't faking worship. They were truly worshiping God. They had pure hearts. They had grateful hearts. And they come worshiping the God. Now, up to this point, the church has been healthy and growing. But now God says, man, I want you to do more. See, worship is the submission of all of us to God. When we come to worship, it's all right, Lord, I'm giving you all. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to thank you. I'm grateful for what you've done for me. But in the middle of this service, God calls Barnabas and Saul to be church planning missionaries. See, the church that has a heart for God, God will work in. See, that's why the importance of corporate worship, you never know when God is going to show up. You never know when God's going to move. You never know when God's going to speak. You never know when God's going to call you to do something. And that's what's going on in this service. And you and I need to understand, where did this missionary movement start? It started in a worship service. Why? Because the people came and they realized, man, we're singing to God, we're worshiping God, we're serving God, we're praying to God, and we're fasting to God because he's the only one that has all the answers. And out of that, out of that service... God calls Barnabas and Saul to be church planning missionaries. And so we need to understand that's the importance of the heart of worship because, man, when we come here to worship, don't play church, you never know what God's going to do. You might say, hey, I don't see the importance of it. But when you come and we all come and worship, you might not be the one that calls, but God might call someone else. And you get to see that and be a part of that. And that's what happened in the service here. God called Barnabas and Saul to be church planning missionaries. Second reason we need to love the mission and be a sending church is this. Number two, may not be up there, but there it goes. We, we've got electricity again. Uh, the church affirms God's call on these church planning missionaries. It says they prayed, they fasted, and then they laid hands on them. The Holy Spirit, did you see that? spoke to them, Barnabas and Saul, but did you see that? Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So God spoke to the church, but God had already spoken to Barnabas and Saul and said, hey, I'm calling you to be church planting missionaries. I'm calling you to go out and plant churches. And so these are the first missionaries. Why were they first missionaries? Because they were receptive. They were responsive to God's call. And because of that, God approves of them being sent, but then the church affirms them. Now, why did the church affirm them? Because they had already been preaching and teaching. They'd already been discipling. They'd already been out doing the mission. They'd already been advancing the Gospels. But when they came and laid hands on them, what they were saying as a church, they were affirming, hey, we believe God has laid his hand on you. He has called you. And by us coming and laying our hands on you, we're saying, hey, we approve, we agree with God that God has called you to go do the mission, to plant churches, and we're here for you. See, God revealed his will through worship. And so he revealed it to them at this time, and we need to understand, many times God speaks in his services to you and I about being on mission with him. But also the church affirms God's call on those he does call to be missionaries. Third reason to be ascending church is this reason. The church obeys the command for missions. The church obeys the command for missions. Now who gave us the command for missions? Well, God did. If you read the last, his words in the last of the Gospels, all four of the Gospels, he gives us the command. And then in Acts 1.8, he gives it to us again. And here it is. But you will receive power in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. Okay, now when did the Holy Spirit come? We know it came on because we read in Acts 2. It came in the day of Pentecost. Now, you and I, when we give our lives to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in within us. But it says the Holy Spirit has come on you and you'll be my witnesses what? in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. That's chapters 1 through 12. Okay? And then he says, and to the end of the earth. That's chapters 13 through 28, and it's still going on. Acts 29, that's where we're living right now. Okay? It, we still, we haven't finished, we haven't finished the mission. We still got to be at it. So the Great Commission is to plant churches. Now what happens here? They go to Cyprus. This was a thriving Roman colony. Okay? And they go there. And it's a major copper area. It's a big city. 
study Paul, where would he go? He would go to the thriving metropolitan cities of those days and would go to share the gospel there to make an impact. But where would he go always first? The synagogue. That's what he did here, right? Text said he went first to the synagogue. What would he share in the synagogue? He would talk about Abraham, Father Abraham, King David. Those are the two dudes in all of Judaism. And you know what he would tell them? He would say, hey, they worship and put their faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What would they say? Get out of here, Paul. And what did we do? He would go take the gospel to the Gentiles. But he always went to the Jews first and gave them an opportunity to get saved. And if they said, hey, we don't want to hear, then he went to the Gentiles. And over and over, look at many times he would do that. And so God has commanded us to do missions, to plant churches, and we're all to be a part of that. And so the fourth reason that we should love the mission and be a sending church is this. The church prays and supports church planners. The church prays and supports church planners. It says they laid hands on Barnabas and Saul. Now what did that mean? It meant that they were going to pray for them. It meant that they were going to serve them, and it meant that they were going to send financial support. Why was this crucial? If you look, they went to go plant, the, plant churches in Europe and Asia Minor, and because of that, you know why? The gospel ended up coming to you and I here in America. Amen. Okay? I mean, if they had not obeyed the, the command or said, hey, uh, we don't want to hear, we're not going to do what God tells us to do. Or let's say the whole church side, we don't really want to care about worship. God's not going to do anything. The gospel man never, ever came to us. Yes, it sparked in 1510 uh, through the uh, 1517, I believe. It's 1517, excuse me. Through the Protestant Reformation, and then eventually came to America. But still, it had to start here. It started here by them being faithful to go. And they needed support. And so as a church, you send out church planners. Now, true truths that you need to be aware of, these are just simple truths that I want to give you. If you're going to send out church planners, and I believe this is what Barnabas and Saul were doing, is number one, church planners are called and sent out by the Holy Spirit. just want to reemphasize this. They were not called by the ministry board. They weren't called by a denomination. They weren't called by a man. They weren't called by the church. They were called by the Holy Spirit. Okay? I think they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They were called to do this just like a pastor is called to be a pastor, preacher. Uh, others are called into vocational ministry. I believe they were called and had a call in their life to go be church planning missionaries. Okay, So they had a call. Second, church planners to preach the word and share the gospel of the lost. No different than what you and I are to do. They're to get out there and make disciples of all the nations. Okay, No different than us but we're just to pray we're to support church planners we're to be there for them god calls them and then he sends them out but as the church left behind we're to be there to support them and pray for them number five the church is to plant new churches churches plant new churches now this is probably new for you so you're just gonna have to chew on i talked to first service you're just gonna have to chew on this for a while okay denominations and in our denomination, we have North American Mission Board, which helps churches all throughout the United States and Canada. International Mission Board sends out missionaries all around the world. Okay? But too many times, we've delegated the mission to them and said, you go do the mission, we'll send you some money. That's not Bible. Are they there to help? And do we need their help? Yes, but new churches are those churches who need a mother church. They need a mother church. Just like this church in Antioch was going to be a mother church for many churches that were going to be planted. See, churches plant new churches, not denominations. I challenge you to find scripture and verse where it's anywhere different. We're called to plant new churches. We're called to help church planters. We're called to help missionaries. We're called to send people out. We're called to help any way possible because that is the great commission to get the gospel out. 
And see, a church that loves the mission is going to be about seeing new churches started, whether it's here, there, Africa, Australia, Haiti, it doesn't matter. We need churches everywhere. And so churches plant churches. Simple. If you don't believe me, we're going to read through the rest of the New Testament. By the end of December, you think different, you come talk with me. If you think different, you need to know this. You better come with chapter and verse and not taken out of context like some liberal preacher. It better be in context. Okay? I love you, but if you think different, come talk with me. I'll be glad to talk with you. Love to talk with you, but, but you better be loaded to bear with some scripture. And I'll listen. But you need scripture. Because this is God's book. And he speaks to us from it. And I don't see any different. If you see different, let me know. Okay? Now you might say, Pastor, we're talking about church. What about me? Glad you asked. Let me give you three points of application for you and me. Number one, we're to live sent out by the Holy Spirit. You see, these, these men were sent out. They were sent out by the church. They were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now you might say, well, Brad, that's just, that's Barnabas and Saul. That's not for you and me. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Look at what Jesus said at the end of his gospel, John. And these are his words for us. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. And as the Father has sent me, I also send you. He's sending, he wants to send you and me out. May we be like Saul and Barnabas who were sent out and did what the Lord told them. May we not be like John Mark. Now John Mark came back around, but in the beginning John Mark left him on this first missionary journey. He got homesick for mama's cooking and left him out there high and dry. Or may we not be like Demas in 2 Timothy 4.10 and he says, hey, hey, he has forsaken me for the things of the world, Paul said. May we not be like them. But may we be like Saul and Barnabas. See, as Christ was, we're to live sent. Our church is to send people out. What we do matters because people's lives are changed about the gospel. Why do we need to be sent? Why? You need to understand, once you give your life to Christ, you're a letter. You're a letter. A living letter. Christ is, is written on your hearts. Why do we need to live sent lives? Just walk in this world for a minute, folks. Turn on the crazy TV. Why do we need to live sent lives by the Holy Spirit? Because we live in a broken, broken, and hurting world. I mean, just look anywhere you go. There's brokenness and hurting and people being ravaged by sin everywhere you go. And see, I believe the mission matters. Why? It's not about style or preference. It's about the mission. Why? Because people without Jesus, people without Jesus, die and go to hell. That's why. Okay? People matter. And that's why God wants to send us into people's lives every day because you are unique people. God loves you. He saved you. He called you. And now he wants to use you. Which leads us to the second point of application. Every Christ follower is to be on mission with God. Now what does that mean? I think this is what it means. It's where you allow God. Okay? Where you allow God to work in your life. And use your life. You know why? Because you're going to intersect with people this week. You're going to intersect with people somewhere this week. It might be at work. It might be at school. It might be at Walmart. It might be at Kroger. It might be at the doctor's office as you wait three hours. It might be at the pharmacy. I don't care where in the neighborhood. Many times God brings people in our lives for one reason. So that our lives might intersect with them. That they might see the gospel in shoe leather. And that they might see it lived out and through that that they might come to know him. That's what being on mission with Christ is. 
God wants to use your life to intersect somebody else's life to show them that this Christianity is not a fraud, but it is real and it's lived in the flesh by the Holy Spirit. You say, hey, give me some examples. Okay, let me give you a few examples. We fed West Lawrence High School football team. Many of you helped. You were on mission with God. Maybe you gave money. Maybe you gave food. Maybe you went out there and served. But no matter what, you were able to be a part of that. Through your prayers, 100 players and coaches got to hear the gospel. Okay? You were part of that. If you give tithes and offerings to church, 21% of the money goes to the missions. Trunk or treat coming up on October 31st. You serve in whatever way, whether it's a trunk, play with kids, uh, at a booth, I don't care where. Registration, love on kids, take them around in a hayride, I don't care. That's being on mission. Why are you going to show the love of Christ to these people in this community? Or some other ways. Hey, you make dolls and they go all around the world. That's being on mission with God. These kin bags that we take into the schools, that's being on mission with God. These Haiti bags, that's being on mission with God. Very shortly, Operation Christmas Child, that's being on mission with God. You serve someone that needs help, that's being on mission with God. You have a gospel conversation with someone, that's being on mission with God. You give someone an invite card, you invite them to church, that's being on mission with God. You go to the LBA Ministry Center and you serve there, you feed people, whatever. You hand out tracts, you're talking about you. Hey, that's being on mission with God. See, there's unlimited opportunities. Those are just a few. And there's many more how you and I can be on mission with God. But we got to understand we're living sent lives out by the Holy Spirit. Number three, let me give you this third point of application because this is an important one. We are to expect opposition when fulfilling God's mission. Now, in verse 6, there's a man by the name of Bar-Jesus here. Okay? Now, the word Bar, Jewish word, means son of. We know this guy is not the son of Jesus. But he's a false. He's a fraud. He's an enemy of righteousness. He's twisted and perverted God's truth. He's contradicting God and Jesus. And you need to understand, Satan, Satan always has a counterfeit out there. And so here they are in Paphos, which there in Paphos they had this huge temple that was erected to Venus, and they did all kinds of vile things and made all kinds of money there. You need to understand, when you go on mission with God, and God gives you an opportunity to have a gospel conversation. You need to understand this is not an academic experience. This is not a sales pitch. This is not a sales present. We don't have, we're not trying to sell people on Jesus. We're just trying to tell people, hey, Jesus changed my life. Hey, I'm a beggar, and here's the bread of life, and he can change your life if you'll give your life to him. But you need to understand when you have a gospel conversation with someone, you need to understand you're going up against all the forces of hell. Because they do not, hell and the devil do not want to see that person you're sharing the gospel with. They do not want to see that person come to faith in Christ. What's going on here? Saul and Barnabas are here and all of a sudden, Elimus, this false teacher here, he's doing everything to keep Sergius Paulius from hearing the gospel. He's trying to persuade him in any way possible from giving his life to Christ. Because he's all about his master, Satan, and money. You need to understand, you share the gospel, it's a dangerous message. You don't believe me? I told the first service this. If you don't believe hell fights people coming to know Christ, uh, I encourage you the next time, if you want to know, I got a text, and it deals with gospel from A to Z, from the beginning to end. I want you to come and sit up here in the choir loft, and I'll promise you, you'll see a front row view picture of the devil fighting the gospel going out in people's lives. Because he's going to fight. You need to understand this. When we go on mission and we're able to share the gospel, there are two truths. Number one. Some people will receive Christ. This governor here did. He, he wasn't persuaded by the miracle. What did he say? He's astonished by the teaching of the Lord. And he gave his life to Christ. He pushed all in and gave his life to Christ. He came to a point where he repented of his sins. He believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And he realized, man, I can't get there on my own. 
He realized he was broken. And he came to a place and believed in Jesus. And he called on the name of Jesus. He put his faith in Jesus Christ. He surrendered his life to Jesus because that word believe means to push all in. And he gave all to Jesus and he followed him. How did he do that? By walking out, aisle, signing the card and praying a prayer? No, he called on the name of the Lord and asked him to save him. And he did. And the Bible says, Jesus said two words, now follow me. Follow me. Remember in Luke 29, 9, 23, if anyone desires to come after me, that come after me, if you translate that Greek word back into the Hebrew, which means to walk after me. See, when you give your life to Jesus, you're to walk after Jesus. Do we live a perfect life? No. That's what's called glorification. That happens when we graduate and go to heaven. You know, right now it's sanctification and hopefully becoming more and more like Jesus instead of more and more like me. And that's a daily thing. Some days we do better than others, okay? That's just, that's just life. But understand, when you're on mission, some people will receive Christ, but some people will reject Christ. You just need to understand, some are going to reject. Does that mean we give up on them? No. We all have those people in our families. If not, you're the only one left in your family. We all have people in our families that don't know Christ. And so we need to keep praying. But don't shove it down their throat at, at Thanksgiving meal, okay? It's only going to make them reject harder. But if God gives you an opportunity, you keep sharing. If he keeps opening the door, you keep sharing. You know when, hey, it's like, oh, I better stop here. Stop. And then pray. So some people will receive Christ. Number two, some will reject Christ. Some are just going to reject Christ. And we just got to understand that. Do we like that? Oh. Uh. Why? Because we know the truth. And the truth has set us free. And we want to see them come to know Christ. So don't give up on them. Just keep praying. Take whatever opportunity God gives you. And so I believe this truth on your outline. And, and this is, I think truth that we need to be remembered and we need to remember every church is to be on mission with God we're to love the mission why because of Jesus Christ we're to speak up and tell the truth of the gospel a church on mission with God will be a sending church why look at the great commission he said go into all the world make disciples of all the nations that's sending is that what Paul and the apostles did yeah I believe so you say, Pastor, I don't think we need new churches here in America. Well, you are sadly mistaken. You really are. There's only 7% of our population, more than likely, that are evangelical. We may have a lot of churches, but we don't have a lot of Bible preaching, Bible teaching, gospel preaching, disciple making, producing churches. We don't have those many. And you need to understand, 10 Mile Radius is church. Only 16% of the people in this county will be in church today. 66% of the people in this county don't go to anybody's church, don't even go to the snake handling church. You need to understand in Boston, only 3.3% of the people, the population there, a huge metropolitan area, go to an evangelical church that would actually hear the gospel today drive a little bit further up the road into Canada in Montreal, Quebec, 0.7%. And if you don't know what that means, that's less than 1%. Don't even go to an evangelical church that would actually hear the gospel today. So don't tell me we don't need no more churches. You haven't been outside the walls of the church if you believe that. There's lost people everywhere. Everywhere we go. And people need to know the Lord. You say, well, those new churches are going to take people out of existing. No, they're not. I've planted churches. If it's somebody called by God, they shouldn't steal other sheep. I'm just going to tell you like it is. I've done church planting. You don't steal other people's sheep. You go out and reach lost people. But you know what I actually have seen also? As a new church that's doing what God has called them to do, and they get out to share the gospel, and we start impacting darkness and lostness, it actually revitalizes other churches because the more people are being confronted with the gospel, you know what's going to happen? More people are going to go to church. Other church. I mean, it's not about one church. It's about 
The church of Christ being exalted and being proclaimed. And so we need to be out there reaching people. The great missionary Henry Martin, he was a missionary to India and Persia. I want to look at what he says here. This is a powerful quote as I wrap up here. He says, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. The nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary we must become. Now, what is he saying? Now, we know scripture says, James 4, 8, draw near to God. He will draw near to you. What it's saying is, is you and I draw near to Christ. We spend time worshiping him. That church was worshiping God. We spend time worshiping corporately. We spend time worshiping him individually. The more we draw near to God, you know what's going to happen? We're going to hear the heartbeat of God. And what is the heartbeat of God? The heartbeat of God beats for people. Why? Because he created all of them in his image. And he wants to see all of them come to know him as Lord and Savior. And so what he's saying is the more we draw closer to God, the more we'll be concerned about people that don't know Jesus. And I believe that is up and down Bible there. The more you and I will spend time with him, we'll realize, whoa, God, you really do care about all people. You really do care about my loved one who is desperately lost. You do have a heart for them. You do want to see them saved. And so you and I need to understand that as a church, we need to be a sending church. We need to live sent lives. And as we go out, you know what will happen? As you and I go out and we live sent lives, we're going to impact this lost and dying world. Will they all come to best say that? It doesn't matter. We want to get them saved. And get in a church and get growing. You say, hey, what if I leave someone somewhere else on the other side of the county or another county? You know what we want to do? We want to find them a good Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church that will help them grow. That's what it's about. That's what the New Testament church was about. See, that's why we ought to love the mission. Because Christ loved us so much. And the more we draw closer to him, the more we'll understand as that song Steve Green sang many years ago, people need the Lord. People need the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you.